for, for all of the bad things and the battles that I faced, all of the great things and the accomplishments I have can only be attributed to the values and the ethos that he bestowed upon me, especially when we talk about being selflessly committed to other people, especially when we talk about being, when you're in a room with somebody, I was brought upon that, that value of you are present, you're attentive, you're you, you, the old thing of respecting your own, like you are completely besotted with who is in that room with you and you make the very, very best of every conversation. Hi everyone, today I am joined by Dean and I'm so excited to have this guest on my show. Um, he is a, a true inspiration and a very, very interesting character. Uh, we're actually part of the same business masterclass group and uh, that's supercharged. And to be honest, I reached out to a bunch of guys and girls in there who were just really like-minded and just wanted to have a little bit of a conversation, talk to them about their lives, what's going on, what they stand for. And, and Dean, really just you stood out, my friend, because the amount that you've, you've accomplished and what you've done over the years has just been mind-blowing. And I just love your personality and I love your um, ethos. So if anyone hasn't seen Dean yet on social media get over there because it's it's certainly entertaining but welcome to the show anyway today my friends oh thank you very much for having me mate I'm very very much looking forward to it um and I appreciate the intro that's very kind I feel like I have to carry you around in my pocket with that one <laughs> just <laughs> yeah. throw that out what, who are you I'm Dean wait there let me pull Dan out the pocket so we can do the introduction yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> what will what I'll do mate is I'll record it like uh on the video ask stuff and then as soon as as soon as someone you know, in, you introduce yourself. Just about one second, mate. I got to pull this out, get it ready to go. <laughs> <laughs> Honestly, that's going to become the norm soon. I tell you, I'll be like, "Who are you?" I can't explain myself. Let me show you who somebody else says about me. Oh my goodness! Yeah, 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 mate. Brilliant. If you start explaining yourself, you're definitely going to get uh, called egotistical. So we need to we need to jump that hurdle before before it gets yes. to that. Yes. So one of the things that I really wanted to talk to you about is um, you're currently in the military. Correct me if I'm wrong. And mm -hmm. you are working strength and conditioning. Mm -hmm. You're doing your online business. You're a very busy man. So yes. first thing, when we, when we started talking, I really, I have to admit, like one thing that as a kid, as even now, I just have the utmost respect for people that, that serve. And I think it stems back to that whole like masculine value, childhood kind of perception of, you know, serving others before yourself. Mm -hmm. um, and it's something that I've done a lot of work on recently. Um, one thing that I haven't told you, I don't think, uh, but I have mentioned to a few other people on the podcast is I'm actually working with a few different mentors, Ollie being one as my, yeah. my business mentor, the same as yourself. Uh, I'm working with a, a healthy masculinity uh, mentor as well. That's and what awesome. that does is provide the kind of things that I suppose um the military does i mean i've got no experience of it but he talks a lot about discipline he talks a lot about responsibility as a man he talks a lot about just turning up and getting things done regardless of the events because you have a purpose to reach for mm -hmm. and i suppose you know from what you've said and what we've spoken about that kind of really came i i, I assume from the military for you in what respect? As in my the discipline that I have? Yeah. So in terms of you, I assume, again, that it is based off the fact that you were in the military and, you know, those kind of things were instilled in you from a very young age. Yeah. So my, I suppose it probably makes sense to go back to my childhood. As a young boy, my dad served my dad served in the military um, all the way through my childhood into my adulthood. Um, he served in the military for 30 plus 30, nearly 30 odd years. So it had, it was in, we were institutionalized with the ethos and core values that my dad kind of brought, brought himself upon. So, you know, we talk about the six core pillars or the six core values within the military um, courage, discipline, integrity, selfless commitment, loyalty, respect for others. These these underpinning core values that the military sort of brand about. And to every Tom, Dick and Harry, they really mean nothing. 
like they don't mean anything they're just fucking words and what my dad did really well is he embodied a very different set of core values that underpinned those six and we go back to this point about being empathetic being compassionate being an absolutely outstanding communicator so all of my life i was accustomed to seeing him ripping the last t-shirt off of his back and making sure the person next to him was okay like it, it sounds really really stupid but my dad would be the type of person that would have a packet of 20 cigarettes and would give all of his 20 cigarettes to the boys in the smoking area like and i'm talking about a time when i was serving in when i served in the military very very early on in my career i remember standing in the smoking area with my dad and my dad just handing out a whole packet of 20 fags like mm -hmm. and let's remember cigarettes aren't cheap like they were a little bit cheaper back then but then they're not they definitely weren't cheap then uh, now sorry but he would still do the same he would pull the cigarettes out and give those to all the guys there and he would genuinely be interested in who they were and to a point whereby i think as a young boy he was a massive influential character in in my upbringing of course he was he's my father but for, for all of the bad things and the battles that i faced all of the great things and the accomplishments i have can only be attributed to the values and the ethos that he bestowed upon me especially when we talk about being selflessly committed to other people especially when we talk about being when you're in a room with somebody i was brought upon that that value of you are present you're attentive you're you, you the old thing of respecting your elder like you are completely besotted with who is in that room with you and you make the very very best of every conversation you know it was those like values and those disciplines that for me personally have allowed me to i don't even think allowed me to succeed because i still think there's so much more i can do and i, do, I wouldn't call myself a success i've just i've just done things you know i my dad was a humble person and i think i'm quite a, hum, a quite a humble person as well like i put myself down before <laughs> i put myself down but ra would rather bring others up and i think all of those values and all of those um all of those core values from from the military those six that we mentioned like i said they can just be words to most people identities can be just be words to most people but it's how you live them and it's how you embody those ethoses and how you how you sort of manifest them into your life so that you become those things you're not empathetic you you live by empathy you're not compassionate you understand and really grasp the idea of what compassion is like being there for that individual understanding their struggles their battles it doesn't matter whether they are the strongest person in the room the most jacked person in the room or somebody who is limbless and doesn't have fucking arms and legs for example you really understand and get to the root cause of who is that individual and why are they so fucking amazing at what they do you know no judgment like that that type of like when you embody those things and those core values of which I weren't taught them. I was just brought up with them. Mm -hmm. You know, we talk about discipline and how the people always ask me, how the fuck do you manage to do all this? I'm like, well, I just, I, it's, it's periods of crazy organized chaos. And then it's periods of ridiculous structure and routine. And the two that there's never, there's never equilibrium between the two. It's just understanding like life is for me, it's, all centered around organized chaos. But because I have those values, because I have empathy, compassion, I'm disciplined and I'm I'm integral and I, be, I like to think I'm authentic. People tell me these things and I really do appreciate them. You become those things, right? And, and that's, that's how I have been able to become the person that I am, like all the way through my childhood because I had a father that, and a mother as well. Like, let's not forget my mum, God bless her soul. Like I, ha I was very blessed. I was a, f I was, I can't even stand there and tell you I had a rough upbringing because I haven't like, I had a mum and dad who fucking loved me, me and my brother looked after us. You know, we had, you know, had new football boots if we needed them or wanted them. We had all these other things, but you know, we were, we were never far from supporting other people and never far from 
truly given up whatever we could. Like my mum was like that as well. Jesus Christ. I mean, my mum would, my mum was a welfare officer or a welfare sort of liaison for years. I'm talking years. And she used to go around all of the other military wives' houses and just make sure they were okay. And, you know, she'd make coffee for them, and bring tea and biscuits into the welfare office at work where in, in the camp and all of the lads in camp knew who she was because she was just such a lovely, endearing woman. And like all of those values that she taught me, it's interesting because I sit here and think about it. Like I've got my dad who is that military man is regimented, is disciplined, has that classic Sergeant major, bad lads, army type of persona, you know, right, come over here. Little that type of like, like, and he had that aggression about him, but he also had, that really unbelievable empathetic and care inside. And I think that a lot of that is to do with the fact that he was married to my mum for 30 plus years. And mm -hmm. for her, like she was, she was a remarkable human being. Anybody that, anybody that says, oh, do you know, do you know Dean Hammond? Do you know his, do you know his mum, Caroline? They would be like, wow, yeah, what, what a woman. She was just known by so many people for being such a remarkable woman. And yeah, you know, she she left an impact in this world. And if I can leave as half of a stamp and impact that she left um, when she walked, when she went up to the pearly gates, I tell you what, I will be fulfilled in my life. That's for fucking damn sure. So off on a bit of a tangent there. But yeah, that's that's kind of a little bit about, you know, things about me, I suppose, if, if that makes sense. Mm -hmm. I think it's such a... And I've said this quite a lot to people. I think it's a crazy time that we live in now because there's so much distraction, so many things going on technologically, apps that are demanding our attention, people that yeah. are demanding our attention and simple things. And you mentioned about just being present. And it's something mm -hmm. that up until a couple of years ago, I'll be honest with you, like I felt I was just like everyone else and I wasn't being present with loved ones. I wasn't being present with family, friends, or even just people, just mm. having conversations with people. I mean, you know, the thing that you'll notice now, people don't have conversations in the street. People don't, mm. you know, when they walk past each other, they, they might go little head nod, or they might go, all right, that's pretty much it. Like, and, and then that's it. You know, we move on and we, we get on with the world, but we'll, we're missing out on so much by just simply not being present. Without a doubt, without a doubt. Can, like, I'm surprised you even said that somebody could say all right to you in the street because nine times out of 10 people's heads are down, squaring at a six inch sort of tech, yeah. uh, six inch computer. Um, mm -hmm. it, 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 it blows my mind. Um, and, and again, like we can't sit here on our high horse and say that we are, we are the, the, the epitome of, of how life and health and performance should be because we're not like, Goodness gracious me, we're absolutely not. I woke up feeling absolutely shattered this morning and emotionally drained. Why? Because I, I was at our business masterclass convention, convention with Ollie and that and all the other team and drinking alcohol. Like, they, listen, and I, yes, I probably spent a bit of time on my phone, et cetera, and social media. But the, that goes back to that point is, is being present. And I said this in a chat when I spoke to the, some of the guys in Superjars is – one of my favorite, favorite words is compartmentalization. I love the word compartmentalization. And people sit there and go, well, what do you mean by compartmentalization? Well, if you think about it in terms of what it is as a crux, compartmentalization as a, as a word is subdivided things into sections. That's all it means. It just means subdividing things down and doing whatever. Well, for me, compartmentalization is breaking everything down in my life that requires a piece of me, a piece of my attention. And if social media, as an online coach, you have to be good at social media, that requires a piece of me. I need to compartmentalize that and I need to put that into something that allows me to succeed. I've got to put time into it. But then that shouldn't draw away from the time that I'm spending with my family. Do you know what I mean? If I'm sat there on the couch with both of my daughters and my wife and we've, you know, we've got a big L couch and we're watching television, it's not sat there trying, should I say, not sat there on your phone answering messages from clients on whatever platform you're speaking to them on. 
you know, it's being present and just watching the film so that, you know, you're, you're feeling the emotions with the kids. Like last night we went to the cinema to watch the new film, Black Adam, you know, and it's not, it's, it's holding my daughter's hand whilst there's a little bit of a scary moment coming in and she's squeezing my hand and I'm like, are you okay? She's like, yeah, I think something's going to happen. And I'm like, yeah, but you've got daddy's hand as well. And if I jump, you've got to protect me. And she's like, but you're supposed to protect me. And I'm like, yeah, let's just do it. <laughs> do you know what I mean? And we're having this fun yeah. banter and you know, this, they're having these great, these great periods of time that allowed me to fill that cup and all, and it goes back to that point about organized chaos. Like everybody has a work, everyone's fucking busy. Everyone's busy, like children, finances, professional roles, you know, not sure where, not sure where the next paycheck's coming in from for some people and, and X, Y, and Z and putting food on the table. Like we're all busy, but like for me, that still shouldn't detract from me compartmentalizing all the shit that people need from me in my life, my role, my children, my wife, you know, myself. Like I need to do something for myself from time to time, my training, my health, my performance, my athletic endeavors of which I just don't feel fulfilled. I still want to keep doing more at the age of 35. All of that comes down and boils down to one word and it's compartmentalization. How do I fill each of those cups? How do I fill a little bit for each cup and make an impact in those areas, a relationship, you know, or even like with you, like this, this is just compartmentalized time. This is me just giving a little piece of me to somebody who I feel is a fantastic human being. If I thought you're a dick, I wouldn't give you my time. But that's yeah. the key principle. Like if you want, if you want to be networked, if you want to network with incredible human beings, you need to find little pockets of time where you can do that. You can engage in conversations. We can have these chats. We can talk in a Facebook group. We can meet up over podcasts, meet up for a coffee. Like, like no, it's almost like no event in my diary is bigger than the next. Every single event is a key event. Mm -hmm. And every single event needs me to show up as best as I can. And on that day, if it's shit, because I've had a crap night's sleep or whatever, or, you know, because we all have emotions and it goes up and down, we're all human beings, then that's fine. But I'm still going to show up in the best way that I possibly can, because I've, mm. I really understand going into that room. I just have to be present with that person and I have to give all of my time. Like when I'm working and I'm programming, I like you, you can see on the screen what my environment looks like. You know, you said before you started, you love that setup. Yeah, but that setup isn't by accident. It's designed with a purpose. You know, it's desi been designed on purpose so I can get the best out of myself. So when I know I put these lights on and I've got my binaural beats on or my lofi music or whatever it is, my brown, brown noise, and the computer gets turned on, the headphones go on, that's me completely immersed in programming for my clients, making the best health decisions that I can for them, really understanding little things, reading into the data, you know, and it's every single client that I work with. It's not just a call at the end of the week to see how things are getting on. Our, let's just keep going. Here's a nutrition plan. Crack on. Thanks. Like, no, it's, it's the three or four times in that week that we're going in and we're checking the data. We're like, right, we can see a bit of a trend here. Let's see if we can try this tomorrow. Here's a strategy. Let's talk about this piece. It's why the four key pillars of it's why the three key pillars that under, underpin performance of everything that we do, strength, movement, and mindset, like they're the three key pillars that allow me to really optimize my client's life. And guess what? They all need a little piece of me. That's mm. all they do. Everything, like everything that we ever do, just needs a little piece of us. So you know, it goes back to that point of, well, how the fuck do you do it all? Just give a small really understand who needs what from me on that day and give a little bit of my time to that person in whatever capacity they need, but be present and do what mm. I can. I think that's a good, I don't know, I think that's a good way that I've been able to break through and achieve things or do things and still be mentally fucking, well, I say mentally sane. I'm not sure I'm mentally sane. There's definitely screws loose, but I'm sure you understand where I'm going with it. Yeah. I think also as well, from a, a personal point of view, being present goes beyond just simply being because mm. the amount of times 
and I've been very guilty of this up until the last few years of my life as well, where my brain works very quick and I have a lot of thoughts very, very quickly. I have a lot of things that I'm like, oh, like I can relate to that. And, you know, in conversations, I would be sat, stood, just waiting for my turn to speak, waiting to add to the conversation rather than just being present yeah. and allowing the conversation to go where it went and being okay with the fact that if I, if I forgot that little nugget of information, I was like, oh, this might be valuable in some way. I would just be like, yeah, I'm fine with that because the conversation's moved on. It took me so long to get over that. And it's actually therapy that helped me to do that because I was just so focused on making everything so um, efficient. But in the process of that, I just wasn't being present for people. I wasn't listening to what they were actually saying. I was just waiting for a pause in the conversation to go, oh, you know, and, and it came from a selfless place but it was a selfish act because I wasn't actually listening. Yeah. And, and something I think that a lot of people who are less self-aware, and I don't mean that in an attacking way, are very guilty of. And, and, and I notice it a lot now. Yeah. But you, you're filled. It's interesting you say that because we're filled every single day with narcissism, ego, ego. We're filled with sexualization. We're filled with you, 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 this is what you want. We, we, we are news hijacked and, and attention stealers in every situation, every situation. And it always draws back to you, what you want, what you need. And it's funny that even as a fucking podcaster yourself, you would think that you are pretty good at listening and speaking but it's in, but it, you're, it's, I'm I'm in the same very much of the same frame and podcasting for me like with you has probably brought those skills on far beyond anything that you can even imagine and one of my one a really good friend of mine is one of his quotes I'm, I'm probably going to butcher this and you'll probably um, you'll probably get this absolutely down to the T is actively listening means actually listening. And for me, I was like, wow, you are so right. Like if you listen to somebody and you're deep in a conversation with them, you're not listening to a trig point where you can go, okay, bang, there's my opportunity to hit the hit the high hit the hit that high peak. There's my opportunity to jump in that conversation. No, you're actually now, as a, and as a coach, you've probably done that as well, is you find you find the the, the bits between the lines. You start listening, you're like, I don't think his issue is X or I don't think her issue is Y. I think it's this. But rather than going, you've got this to do or here's my here's my here's my little nugget and my value bomb. It's like, let me ask an engaging question. Let me see if they can think about that thing. And as a coach, you start you start embodying that type of mm -hmm. that type of communication. And I like when I heard that actively listening means actually fucking listening. You got two yeah. ears and one mouth for a reason. It's so you can do two times as much listening as you can speaking. There's a good ratio there, <laughs> which means you need to spend more time letting things come in than coming out. And I was very, like, very much like you, a verbal, you just call it verbal diarrhea just used to spitball shit at people without really it having any meaning until you start listening to listening to people. And it mm. goes back. I think what's really, I, I love what you said because that it does take time, right? It takes a long time and you're probably still practicing. And now I get it wrong in so many situations, so many situations. And I always go back and I'm like, I wish I could be my fucking mum Cause all she used to do was just sit there and get, belt fed absolutely verbal diarrhea on every single day just used to listen to problems just used to listen to military wives where their husbands were deployed away all over the world in iraq and afghanistan and overseas in cyprus falklands estonia wherever in the world and just used to go is there anything i can help you with do you need anything from me 
what would yeah. what would be you know what would be a what would be a good outcome of this conversation what can i do for you do you want a cup of tea those words do you want a cup of tea you know it's going to be a deep conversation when that starts yeah you know and that's it's a, that's so beautiful it, and it just like and i just sit i'm like it i just i'm mesmerized by the fact that she was able to be like that so for me mm-hmm for somebody who I was with my dad and my dad was like, again, always trying to listen, but add value. Like you would, you know, always trying to add value. And how can I help you boys? What do you need from me? When sometimes it's just, yeah, just shut up and listen. And it's probably one of the most profound things that we can all do as fitness professionals is when you get on a call with somebody or when you're speaking to somebody or engaging in conversation with somebody, I challenge yourself to only ask open-ended questions. So rather than add value, only ask open-ended questions and see what happens. Not yes or no answers. Things like, ah, well, have you considered this and where do you think this could take you? Mm -hmm. What do you think about this? And see if that brings a better conversation with the individual. Because I guarantee you, it Mm -hmm. will, you'll just, you'll come away from that being so energized and come away from that actually feeling like you've given value rather than just taking a verbal shit on somebody's ears and saying something which didn't really mean shit about fuck, as they say. A term phrased by Darren Roberts, who is a great, great guy. Uh, he works for Red Bull as a S&C coach. If you haven't heard of Darren Roberts, you need to go, yeah. Like, when, when what you say means shit about fuck, it's time to shut up. Mm-hmm. Like, a great, great that. phrase, you know. So good, isn't it? Like, <laughs> and there's these little things that are simplistic. And it goes back to that, like, kiss principle. Keep it simple, stupid. Just ask them a mm-hmm. question. Ask them an open-ended question. Let them find the answer. And then shut up. That's what, that goes back to the point about compartmentalization. Like, I'm going to give people my time. They want my time. So I'm going to be there and be present for that person. My daughter, my wife, both of my children, my dad, my brother. Like, I haven't got a dog, but if I did, I'd probably give the dog some love as well. You know, <laughs> just give your time. Like that's all we want as well as human connection, right? Mm. And somebody to fucking listen. That's the key. I think, I think it's so easy as um, men tend to be much more logical thinkers than, than the mm. women. It's such a, I, I've, I, I spoke to a few different people about this recently and it's so difficult in those moments, I've definitely got it wrong. I definitely have. And it's only the last few months that it's really clicked for me that I was trying in any situation. So as a coach, it's, it's, you have to walk that line between problem solver, empathy, all of those sorts of those points, you know, that you're not just devaluing them. You're not devaluing the issues that they're facing because it on paper, it's very, very simple. You know, we need to do X, Y, Z to elicit whatever result that they want. But obviously we are not simple creatures. Human beings are the most complex species there is. You know, we have so much going on in the world. We're exposed to so much relationships. We're exposed to a a, a massive amount of information on a daily basis. And all of this makes things so much more complicated. And simply, I mean, not even as a coach, as just a human being, you know, we're just talking you and i now the one way to make either one of us not feed, feel valued is just if one of us was sat here or stood here going yeah and then we're just trying to fight for the the, the conversation rather than letting things flow in yeah. relationships if you have an argument and you know girlfriend wife boyfriend partner whatever starts telling you about things starts telling you about issues or moans about their work t- in that day I used to get this so wrong with my, my exes and I'd just be like, well, if you just did like, I would just approach it with this logical problem solving. I was just like, yeah, but if you just, you know, go X, Y, Z, like that's problem solved. And it was the worst thing ever because not only was I not actively listening, I wasn't being present for them. Mm. I was also just devaluing their whole experience. Yeah. Do you know what I find the most devaluing? And you've just said like men, men, men catastrophize and then try to put sequences and logical events in place to get to an outcome. Women feel it with emotion like they really do. But 
going back to a point you've just said there about in being in the conversation, the, the, the work you cannot, you cannot do another thing if you're truly engaged in the conversation. But how many times have you been in a conversation in the past year and that person's been on their phone or has been looking over their shoulder yeah. or has been fiddling with a set of keys in their pockets or whatever those things are. Like you physically cannot do another thing if you're truly engaged in a conversation. And for me, I've got to that stage where I'm like, I know, I know if that person is truly, truly listening. Because if they're really, really listening, they will be, the eye contact will be really strong. Eye contact would be great. Body language would be, it could be a mix of different things because there's emotion that might be involved in the conversation. But nine times out of 10, there isn't another thing that's going on in that room when we're in that conversation. If me and my wife are having a conversation, like it's same again at dinner. You can't eat dinner and have a deep, meaningful conversation. It's a great starting point. But I want to sit with my wife and look at her in the eye, have a cup of coffee and just like the conversations that we have between us. Because it creates a connection and it creates meaning, it creates empathy, it creates compassion, it creates intimacy. And then off the back end of that, we can then come to a resolute. We can resolve whatever that is. If there is a problem, it's the same with your kids. It's exactly the same with your kids. You're like, I truly believe kids will become little shits if you don't actually spend time listening to them. It's, it's really simple. Like it's really, really simple. It's difficult in practicality, but it's simple in theory. You just have to listen to your kids. Imagine if you sat down and said to your kid, oh, how was your day? Rather than getting your phone and going, oh, how was your day? Did you have a good day? Like they can see that you're not listening to them. They're not stupid. They're then going to emulate that exact same behavior when they get to 16, 17 years old. They're not going to listen to their friends. They're not going to share their emotions with you. My daughter, my eldest, is the most emotionally intelligent 11, 12 year old I have ever met in my life. A across all other kids to her age. Like it, it's ridiculous how emotionally clever she is. She comes in, she's like, she can see when I've had a stressful day. It's like, daddy, has, has work been okay? You seem really stressed out. I'm like, do you know what, sweetheart? It has, it's been a really difficult day today. I had so much going on. I think, what, what do you think we should do? And she's like, should we go and train in the garage? Or should we go and do some exercise? Should we go for a walk? I'm like, yeah, let's go for a walk. Come on, let's do it. She's so emotionally aware. And I'm, she's, she's, a, she's a little shit like every other kid. Like she is an 11 year, 12 year old girl. Of course she is. She has tendencies to be somewhat uh, deviant is the word. I think is probably the best way, but she's just emotionally aware. And that's, I think, because Rachel and, and I have tried to do a bit of an okay job, getting her to explore her emotions and understand things. Like she's about to go through that period in her life as a girl, as a young woman, and she's comfortable speaking to both of us about it, which is amazing. Because mm. I have friends that have got daughters and kids and X, Y, and Z that won't have that conversation because in their world of compartmentalization, they are continuously hijacked by news, hijacked by social media and hijacked by everything that they fucking do that they're never ever present in the conversation with their kids or they're never present in the conversation with their family. Like, what are you doing? What are you fucking doing? I've got a board that has, um, and this is, I, I actually got this from a good friend of mine, Matt Peacock. What a fucking human being this guy is, by the way. It's the, it's your life in bullet points, your life in dots. There is literally a hundred dots down the left-hand side and 52 dots across each line. And it represents your life in years. And you scribble out a little black circle at the end of each yeah. week. When you look at that, and you really, again, compartmentalize how much fucking time you've been on this earth and how much you've got left, considering most people, most average people will live till about 80, 85, give or take. Give or take a few years. Let's just argue sake 80. If you've been on the world, been in the earth for 30 of those years, those dots and those lines look scarce. And you spend more time trying to please other people and 
don't give time to the people who really want you to be present and don't compartmentalize in your life who actually needs pieces from you. As an online coach, we're more worried and more concerned about impressing other online coaches. I'm like, no, the people you want to be fucking impressing are the, your clients. Give them more. Give them so much that they're like, wow, this guy is unreal. This girl is unreal. Whatever. Like those people need shit from you in your life. So like you, you are and it goes back to your, like, I don't want my girls to grow up in a world where, and they will inevitably, they fucking will. They're going to grow up in a world where they have to come bow down to the social norms of life and the society that they currently live in. Like as hillbilly and as hickety pickety and as fucking fluffy and fairy as you think that might be. Like I want to, I want my girls to be as innocent and protected from that as much as I can. Cause I want them to have a fucking really good childhood and explore sport and travel and do stuff like there's nothing wrong with doing that giving them time when they need it do i still get it wrong you're fucking damn right i get it wrong absolutely i broke down in tears at the supercharged q4 event on friday because kieran from total mental performance asked us all to write out what is your setback shit list on your setback shit list write down everything that you have done wrong in your life. And that was it. Fucking floodgates opened. As soon as I wrote the end of that list, I realized how, not realized, but emotionally, it was like a big wow, a big fucking wow moment. Because for two years of my life, I relied on my wife to be a single mum, And I didn't give a fuck it. Not that I didn't give a rat's ass, but I was more concerned about me going out partying and driving my car like a twat. Then looking after my eldest daughter, coming back from deployments in Afghan Afghanistan and being an absolute fucking knob, a narcissistic and egotistical prick, because I wasn't present. I would much rather be present with people that didn't give a shit about me, and much present present with people that back then, yeah, I've maybe stayed in touch with one or two people, but realistically, when my eulogy statement's getting read out at my fucking funeral, are they going to be stood there? Doubtful. Fucking doubtful. And on that shit list, wow, what a moment that was. And it's yeah. like being okay to be vulnerable with people. So like that, that moment then it was like, fuck, you know, I've been through some serious shit in my life, but he then had us write out well, what's, what makes you uniquely you, what's your unique selling point as a human. And I was like, well, I'm this, I'm that. And it's a fucking big emotional experience because actually i got so much to make up for for my kids and my wife doesn't mean i've got it right i've just learned from it and if you learn something fuck me take it away and run to run to the hills of it run to the fucking hills of it because we're always constantly news hijacked because we're never present in a conversation because mm -hmm. again and i challenge anybody when you go into a conversation next if somebody's looking around the room or they're on their phone or on their keys just say these words. Are you actually listening? But yeah, 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 yeah. Put your fucking phone and keys away then. Stop writing. Put your pen down. Look at me. Turn the telly off. Listen to what I'm trying to say to you. Mm. And who knows? Like mental health, mate, is a big, big deal for me. A big fucking deal for me. It means everything because of the people I've worked with, the people who I've have who i've lost through post-traumatic stress disorder trauma ambient anxiety chronic stress you know everything in depression everything between the eyes and to the back of the head is somehow tapped away and do you know what if we were able to just be present and have a conversation imagine how much that would change that's a big fucking yeah. deal it's a big deal fucking big deal mate hmm. i think it's 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 funny because I'm going to sound like a mad conspiracy theorist here, but um, ultimately, you know, these apps are designed, they spend billions, they spend so much money to <laughs> keep you on them. Yeah. And, you know, even in the, even in the sense, that I don't know how true it is, um, but I'm, I'm fairly certain the last or when Facebook was developing, the reason why we scroll is because it's 
it's symbolic of the, you know, the casino rolls. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That would make sense, actually. That would make a lot yeah. of sense. And um, so I'm fair, I, I don't know where I got this from. Uh, I'll find out and try and put it in the bio of the, the podcast episode. But they're, they're designed to hold our attention. You know, and, and even y- your notifications. I'm, I'm, um, I have the tendency to be a very all or nothing, very addictive kind of character. Um, so obviously that has its pros, but the cons that come along with that are, if I see a notification, I want to clear it. Like that's my like mental default. Yeah. So I'm like, oh, what is that? And, and I've had to consciously fight that because in situations where, you know, I, I can feel my phone vibrating, I'm like, oh, what is that? And it's that, I'm like, you know, it's, we've got to find out. And I've been in situations and so many of us will have been in the situation where you just find yourself mindlessly on your phone. You're like, what am I doing? Yeah. You, we spoke briefly about um, TikTok in, we did. in 2020, whenever it first came out and the world was a completely different place, I downloaded it. And I just like, I, I'm an online coach. So I was in a very fortunate position where w- my working life hadn't really changed. But I remember TikTok suddenly blew up and I was like, okay, fine. Let's look at what this social media is. Um, is it something that I need to be using for my business? And like, the, for the first few days that I used it, time just disappeared. I was like, what the hell? I'm like, half an hour had just gone. An hour had just gone. And I was like, I, I don't even remember the videos that I was watching. At yeah. least with something like YouTube, most of the stuff that I watch on YouTube is in mostly things that I am interested in. It's educational to some point. TikTok, it was just like funny videos or dances and stuff. I I genuinely couldn't think of one single video that I'd watched in that time frame. And I was like, nah, I'm getting rid of this. Now, I've decided to go back on TikTok, but my rule is I don't consume any content. I just produce the content. And that's, that's it now. Like I'm just because at the point of consuming, what is it actually bringing to me? You're right. Dude, you're and, so and, right. And, and on that topic of consumption, again, let's uh, get the tinfoil hats out. But you mentioned the news and you've mentioned it like repeatedly. And it's something that I'm so passionate about. And I've, I've even had conversations with my family about it. I'm like, you do realize you're consuming constant negativity. Like name one positive story that has been in the news recently. I haven't consumed and, the news for over five years, if that's yeah, anything to and, go by. Yeah, and, and that's the thing. Like, and I made that decision a few years back. I don't read the newspaper. I don't watch the news on TV. I don't have the notifications on my phone for any of the news stories because it's just constant negative press about everything that's wrong with the world. Yeah. And there's so much, there's so much good out there that we just simply don't hear about. There's so many good people that we don't hear about. And, you know, you, you'll often come across this on social media, which one of the things that I do love about social media is when people are in times of like absolute plight and just devastation, you see that beautifulness of the human spirit and humanity where people who don't necessarily even know each other get together and they just help in whatever way they can because of the empathy. And I think we forget that. We're so inundated with negativity and, and maybe it's a British thing. You know, we, we do tend to, our conversations tend to normally be about, you know, oh, the weather's not good or, you know, I hate my job. Like, you know, those sorts of things are the conversations that we have. And it's something that I made a real effort with, with my family, with everyone is to avoid those things. Mm. I read a book a few years back. I forget the, the name of it, but there was a, a it was a, there was a challenge in it where you weren't going to say anything negative for 28 days. You could think it, you could, you could think it, but you couldn't vocalize it. And it was something that I tried to do and I kept having to restart it because I'd said it and then I'd be like, ah, but once I'd gone through that process a few times, I started to be a lot more mindful of the language that I was using, the conversations that I was talking about, because it meant that 
yeah, there's like stuff going on. And if ultimately I can have a conversation with someone to solve that issue, great, let's do that. Let's face this head on and let's actually strive to make progress in the direction of something that we can change. Yeah. If it's not, if it's just a general news story, what is us discussing it going to do? It's just going to bring down the vibrations. It's going to bring down our mood. And we're both going to be sat there going, oh, that's, that's just pissed me off. I'm not going to lie. Yeah. You're absolutely bang on the money. Like one of my favorite quotes, a candle loses nothing from lighting another candle. Mm -hmm. Loses nothing from lighting another candle. That simply translates as you lose nothing from bringing positivity to a conversation and bringing somebody up. You lose everything if you're an absolute toxic, negative human being in every interaction you have with somebody. And you, and if that's all your consumables are, then the likelihood is that you're never going to change from being negative and toxic. So like you just said there, I go on YouTube as well. I only go on YouTube to consume some educational content. And there's a small little folder I've got for entertainment. You know, some classic, like I like some of the, uh, there's some great little fitness YouTube YouTubers out there that put some really cool content out. And it's really like, it's quite entertaining and interesting. It's like I love watching things like the Buttery Brothers. That's my Buttery Bros is, is like, they're in the CrossFit space. They're just cool human beings, really loud out there, vibrant characters. And I resonate with those people. I resonate with both of them, but they just put entertaining content out there and it's positive. There's nothing negative about it. The entertainment stuff is again, positive. It doesn't mean you can't consume negativity, but it just means that, or negative content. It just means you have to really ask yourself the question. Like you've just said that, like, what is it actually doing for you? Because all you're going to do is catastrophe. I have an irrational fear of catastrophe taking place every single day of my life. I've had to deal with it for fucking years. I have an irrational fear that X or Y or Z is going to happen. I catastrophize over everything. Accident happened over there. This happened in here. Like, what if, what if? You have to do a lot. And that that came from consuming everything because in the era of like the Afghanistan and um, Afghanistan and Iraq days, like that was all that was on the news. X has done this. We've done that. This has happened. X, Y, A, B, like all these other things. Like it was constantly after nine 11, it just became everything. It became everything on social media, everything, or even when it was a thing, but it became everything on the news. So I catastrophize over every single thing. Even to a point where I remember watching a news video or a news article on, and this was going back like young adulthood, watching something on the news about a comet or something that had a projection to hit the earth in 20 or year 2000 or something stupid, like it was either 2000 or like whatever it was. And I was like, I'm going to lose everything. I'm going to lose my family. I'm gonna, literally going to lose everything. And it had like a 0.0001% chance of hitting us in 2020. For years, I shit myself every single time. And as soon as we got to the date, I was fucking petrified. Petrified of what was going to happen on that day. And I just logged it in the back of my mind because I just constantly consumed just this toxic shit. It was a 0.0001% chance. Like you have more chance of winning the fucking lottery and being struck by lightning on the same day than that happening. Like what the hell? But because you're consuming this negative shit all the time, it just, it, it literally overflows your mind. It takes over everything that's in your head to a point where you cannot think logically. That's an irrational fear of something taking place, which is ridiculous absolutely ridiculous like, like do you know what i mean like yes that may well happen in the future but my god come on it's it, it, it and i think for me like we don't have news on in the house we don't really watch the news we might watch because my wife's american we might watch a little bit around like who's going to become when the presidential elections are on 
like she'll watch a little bit of that or or I'll watch when the election coming out for, for, for the UK. It's a little bit around there just because there's a small piece of interest in who's going to lead the country. Quite interesting. But the it, it's it's minimal. It's fucking minimal. It's absolutely minimal for those good reasons. But I'd much rather sit there and put something on YouTube or, you know, I don't know, come and write a piece of content or something that's a bit more positive, something that just doesn't draw me attention. I don't have the time to do it either, but I can completely appreciate what you just said. And I want to go back to a point that you said earlier, like you you mentioned around your consuming TikTok and just endless death scroll that everybody <laughs> has. So I did a I did a talk at a upgrade premium event for some of the uh, masterminds in, in Ollie's group. And the first task I got everybody to do was open up their phone, go on to the general part of their phone into settings and then click on screen time. Mm -hmm. And then I asked everybody in that room on average to read out their number. And there wasn't one person in that room that had, and as online coaches, I understand there will be a, an ounce of business that's being done there. But most people were in that room because they wanted to get a bigger client base or build a more healthy and profi prof profitable, prosperous business. Okay, that's cool. As we all were, we're all there. We all want that. But the average, nobody had an average that was under four or five hours. So you really have to ask yourself a question here. Like, if you're truly getting shit done, if you're truly doing things on your terms, if you're... And we're talking about online coaches here. Online coaches, I suppose, kind of, I'm not going to say have a right because it's not a right, but kind of have a little bit of a reason as to why they would maybe be online a little bit more than others because lead generation, email marketing, social media marketing, et cetera, all those types of things. Cool. That's great. But even as an online coach in that room to have less than, to not, to have, to not have less than four hours daily screen average time is a scary place to be. And I'm sat there going, well, how much, how much are you actually getting done? Ah, I'm just really busy. You're not fucking busy. You're not busy. There's 168 hours in a working week. On average, as an online coach, yes, you work for around about 90 to 100 of those hours because you're around the clock as an online coach. But realistically, if you time block that, what are you doing with your time? What are you doing with your time? We sleep on average 50, 56 hours a week. So you've got 110 hours spare in your working week and your capacity to make the number one greatest goal that you want to achieve a reality. Whatever those things are in body, brain, business, health, professional, social, fun, family, whatever. If you want to achieve something in those areas, yet your daily screen times at seven to eight hours, you are wasting a fucking insane amount of time that you are not going to get back because you're not fucking present. In the moments that you're with your family, you're not present in the moments that you are creating content or communicating or conversing or doing something practical. How many times do people walk up fucking Scarfell Pike or Ben Nevis or whatever other peak in the UK just to get to the top and take a photo or video the whole fucking route? Enjoy the route. Do the fucking walk. Mm -hmm. Like, just do the walk. It like, I, I, it baffles me. It baffles me. That, and I, I challenge anybody right now to go on their phone, type, go into settings, click on general, or if you're an Android user, I've got nothing for you because I am an Apple user, so I don't know what route you, I don't know what route you go, but go into settings and click on screen time and just see how much of your life is being consumed by a seven inch, six inch screen. Because I tell you what, it will be a sharp reality. It will be a really, really sharp reality. And uh, listen, I'm, I'm exactly the same as every other human being. I have days where X, Y, and Z, but don't then complain about not getting to the thing that you want to get to or achieving X, Y, and Z when you haven't dedicated time to it. People say to me, ah, oh, when they come online, I'm just, I'm struggling for time to get the program in this week. I'm, I'm okay, cool. That's really awesome. Just do me a favor, go on your phone, open settings and tell me how many hours you've been on your phone over the past three days. Uh, about four, six hours. I'm like, okay. Now, I haven't told you, you've realized that on your own, that your time is being probably not spent wisely or productively. You tell me you want to achieve X performance marker. 
You tell me you want to work up to run the London Marathon. You tell me you want to row a sub seven minute, two kilometer. You tell me you want to lose 10 kilos, not because you just want to lose the weight, but because you want to be an example to your children. You want to be happy. You want to be healthy. You want to be confident. You want to feel fucking sexy. You want to feel healthy. You want to be happy. You want to wake up with no mood or just feel like you hate yourself. Implicit, like everything inside of you, you just want to hate yourself because you're overweight by 10 kilos. You tell me you want to drop that weight, yet you're spending eight hours on your phone on a day. Mm. So do you really want that number one thing that you've just told me you want? Or is it just a societal pressure that you feel you need to lose that 10 kilos? The rule of five. I want to do this. Why? Because of this reason. Why? Yeah, but, you know, these are the things and the reasons I want to do that. La, la, la. Yeah, but why? Five whys. Then we might start unpicking and unpeeling an onion layer. And if you get to the bottom of that why, that little stupid phone screen that you've got, that's six inches tall, two, three inches across, and brights up your life, or lightens up your room, that might, you might just look back and go, yeah, I'm wasting a fucking metric ton of time there. Yeah. And it's just, a, it's, it's, it's a self-realization process that you've got to go through. And it takes time with some people. With others, it's not. But you just have to, like, the six, seven billion people on this planet. There's like two and a half billion people, I think, using Facebook or something stupid like that or social media, whatever it is. Mm -hmm. I would argue, and this, I'm going to pull this stat out my ass. I reckon at least 70, 80% of those people that are using it are on social media for longer than three hours a day. And I would ask them what they're actually on social media for as well. Because consuming? the thing yeah. is, the thing is, we're, what, what are you consuming? And you and I both know social media has changed. You know, I've used social media now since as long as it's been about for my business. Hmm. And I'll be very frank. I've now got to the point I would not use social media if I didn't have an online business. I just wouldn't because what would I consume on it? Hmm. I'd, I'd use YouTube probably. Yeah. So I'll, I'll reframe that. I would definitely still use YouTube, but Instagram, I probably wouldn't. Twitter, I wouldn't. None of the big social medias. I don't think I would sit and consume anymore because I'm just like, well, what, what's the point? You know, if I want to find something out, I can get a book. I can use Audible. If I want to contact my friends, okay, I'd use WhatsApp if we can count that as a social media. Yeah. But what are most people doing on social media? We know the answer. Self-validation. Self-validation. Ex external validation. Exactly. And that's the big point is so many people are spending their lives, spending money, portraying a life that is not actually what they live to impress their followers. And often their followers aren't even like that close friends with them. It could just be the fact that you went to school with them 20 years ago, 10 years ago, you might've had one conversation with them. Mm. And yet you're still, when I say you, people in general are just putting out this content of just bullshit. Like just what are, what are you actually trying to prove here? How are we, how is this bringing any value to your life? And how is it bringing any value to the closest around you? And that's my opinion on it. Now it's got to the point where I'm just like, ah, just, it's just not for me anymore. I, yeah, I, th I can, I think I can kind of, I can see your side of the story there and I can definitely attest to having similar thoughts with it. Like if I was, if I wasn't an online coach, would, would I use social media? I, I kind of think I would because I still believe I can create some form of impact with people. Authentically, I truly believe that I can help somebody do something, even if on social media, it was just a space to have a conversation and listen in the DMs or whatever. Would I use it? Yeah, I think I might do, but certainly not in the capacity I'm using it now. I wouldn't be using it as much. That's for damn sure. I wouldn't be posting like I post content on social media every day without fail. If I miss a day. 
shit happens. But every day without fail, I post content, not to get new clients, to help people that follow me. Because organically, I built a following, probably like you, organically built a following that apparently based on people that like what I put out because people can resonate with me because people like how I deliver fitness or health or performance. They just can resonate with it. They're like, yeah, I get you. You're a fucking normal person. And I'm not putting a sales pitch at the end of every post. Work with me today for 20% off X, Y, and Z. Like whatever, you know, like just genuinely putting stuff out and go, hey, try this, use it, see what happens. I think I would maybe use it in the same capacity. But it, you definitely struck an interesting thought there in that if, what would I do? If social media wasn't a thing, I, I would just go door to door and speak to people about fitness. Like, can we, can I get you out? Can we go and do something? Can we, I'd literally knock on people's doors and put flyers in and say, come and join my, the boot camp or come and join this gym or come and train in my sanctuary, my garage sanctuary. Like, let's just do, let's do something. Just knock on people's doors. Say, do you want to work with me? Come on, let's go. Like, that's how you would generate clients. I wonder how many people, if online coaching wasn't a thing, would stop what they're doing there and then, print off a thousand flyers and walk around the whole of their fucking local area and post a flyer through every letterbox saying, hey, my name's Dean and I help people bridge the gap between health and performance. I help you build a monumental resilient mindset. I help you physically break any barrier that is possible in your path through strength, movement, and any other facet of health and performance you can think of. I help you do that. And guess mm. what? I do it out of a room that's 14 feet by eight feet in a little garage. All I want you to do, just turn up. First one's on me. How many people would do that? Because I guarantee you the online coaching space would dwindle down hugely because of that. Mm -hmm. And it goes back to that question, like, are you really in online coaching for creating impact with people in health and performance? Like I've been doing this 15 years. You're pretty stupid giving it up now. I love it. You love it. Like there's no greater feeling than seeing whoever it is, whoever, it is, even mm -hmm. if it's a Karen and a Ken, you know, and sorry to all the Karens and Kens out there. It's just, it's, it's, it's the name. It's the name that gets branded around, isn't it, at the moment? But do it doesn't matter. Rap, don't it they? doesn't, yeah, they do. Karens. I'm, <laughs> let's use a different name. Let's go Joan and John. Like, <laughs> but even, even those people that are just fed up with, like, just constantly whinge and moan and whine about everything in their life. And they're just like, fuck, this is shit. Like, there's something you can do for those people. But in the online coaching space, I'd love to see how many people would still be coaches off the back end of social media just collapsed and crashed today. And how many people would have legitimate practical experience in delivering physical training, health, mm. wellness, like, and yeah, like we've become so digitized. I wonder it's if the thing where it goes, I don't know where it's going to go. Mm. It's the thing that I always say to people when they ask me about online coaching, especially if they've not done it in person before, I'm like, you need to learn how to serve people because yeah. you can't, in my opinion, I don't, I don't care what anyone says. You cannot go from nothing to online. You miss so much by not understanding what happens in a gym based environment face to face, because often it's not what they're telling you. It's, it's what you can see what's going wrong yeah. because they'll, they'll tell you one thing in a conversation that, and they don't necessarily, they're not necessarily aware that what they're telling you isn't particularly accurate, but you can see, you know, is their training intensity at the right level? Are they making progress? Are they ticking boxes? Is there stuff going on in their life that, you know, will impact their mindset? Is there all of these variables going on? That you have to be compassionate and empathetic towards you cannot just drill them into the ground and be like well why the fuck are you not putting effort in that's yeah. just not it's not going to wash and yet you see so much and hear so much about these online coaches in my opinion who have just got into the game because the border to entry the, the barrier to entry sorry is so low yeah you don't even need an official qualification to be an online coach which is scary 
Um, I actually welcome people though into the industry. I don't think the industry is saturated. Saturated no, means there's 100%. a scarcity mindset. Like we mm-hmm. we like we need to remove the scarcity mindset. Like there mm-hmm. is there is so much out there for people to do. But you're right. Mm-hmm. We finish. You finish your minimum barrier. Minimum minimum barrier to entry as a personal trainer, and you're told, ah, uh, the you, you you know you've done your six weeks or twelve weeks, whatever the whole long course is. You're then forced to go down a long line space at the age of 19, 20, when you're still finding yourself, like you're still trying to measure what your self-worth is. And what do we do? We stick something on social media that's content specific, but it's filtered. And you're seeing like half naked photos of you as the coach plastered all over your social media. Are you really giving content like that? You know what I mean? Like it comes back to that. Like why? I do believe that everybody, as a coach, has a right to be online, and everybody as a coach should explore that. But it shouldn't then come at the detriment of deliver it, delivering world class results. Because mm-hmm. if the world class results are not being delivered, but you have a huge online presence, and you you can show up on camera with you in the room creating content and make it look all jazzy and fantastic. Yet when you get on a Zoom call with somebody, you're like, you're like fucking chalk and cheese. Mm-hmm. It's like watching paint dry. You know, it, it like if those, like you've got to do some serious introspection and self-reflection to find out, well, how do I get the world-class results? Mm-hmm. And like you just said that, it's the practical application of that coaching. Like it's dealing with human beings in face to face so that you can kind of put things together. I don't think you can be a fully on like you. I don't think you can be fully online. In my opinion, I don't think you can be fully online. I truly believe that in order for you to be a remarkable coach, there has to be practical application. You've got to see it, feel it, do it with other people. And see how they react to you in that in that in that time of frame in that frame of time. Sorry, you've got to do it. You've got to you've got to try your principles, your methods. You've got to build that with people you work with to decipher and create your philosophy. Like my philosophies are changing, they're changing and shifting. My principles are somewhat the same. I have principles, but they're evolving as the years go on. Methods are evolving. We have umpteen in the thousands of methods and it's using and picking the right ones that you can put to the client that make the world-class result easy for them not easy in the sense as it's easy to achieve as in easy for them to understand and grasp mm. yet you're fed into an industry of oh, here's a pt level three course you've passed that let's take you online and just work on body composition and the only method of body composition that you know is let's do squat bench deadlift press strict press uh and let's do some fasted cardio i'm like okay that's interesting you've now got an individual that has some it band issue we now have an individual that has maybe some hip flexor issue has i don't know had suffered in the past with some sort of acl meniscus lcl mcl damage to their knee you're gonna make that guy squat you got an individual with limited range of shoulder abduction and flexion. Now, what are you going to do? You're going to make that individual start bench pressing. They have limited external rotation. Like, but we're just going to use a bench press method. That's all we're going to do because we haven't gone out and explored the methods and worked with people in a face-to-face setting, being present in the moment, not working on our phone or learning something through YouTube, actually going to seminars and listening to people speak and watching them apply things understanding biomechanics and engineering and understanding business and understanding health and nutrition and dietetics because you've gone out and done a practical workshop Mm -hmm. because that six week qualification really doesn't actually mean that much. It blows my mind that they just teach us so little in terms of business. It, It was years genuinely years I, I got my pt qualification when i was 19 or 18 one of the two i can't remember um i'm coming up to 30 now and it was genuinely years before i actually classified myself as a business 
or, or, or thought about, it was like, yeah, actually, I am a business. For, for years, I just thought, yeah, I'm just turning up, doing my sessions. I was still actively pursuing the best possible results, being as empathetic and trying to be the best co coach that I could be. But it was years before I actually started taking my business seriously. But I don't you know, think... How I don't think these NGBs, I don't think it's their responsibility hmm. to have a level three personal trainer. This is my opinion, but I don't think it's their responsibility to teach that personal trainer about business. Their goal is to teach the personal trainer about the fundamental underpinning theories of strength, cardiovascular training, cardio respiratory health like diet like their very basis of that course is just to teach some sort of knowledge base and adapt a whole broad spectrum of things it's a low barrier to entry so that you can then go oh, i really like nutrition what can i do i'm going to branch off and go and do perhaps a perhaps go and work on some sort of nutritional pathway maybe i become a dietitian or a nutritionist and you maybe try that and I don't think niching down into one thing is a good thing either. I think you need to explore all options. Do the strength elements. Go as far into the realm of weightlifting and powerlifting. Come back a little bit. Go into the endurance world. Try the triathlon piece, the marathon runners, the endurance work. Go down that road. Work with coaches, running coaches. Like Find ways so that you get this big thing. Like By the time you're 35, 40, maybe it's worth considering, oh, well, what type of thing do I maybe want to work on now? Like we're forced to niche down on all these things and become a business when I'm actually like, well, no, go and fucking actually learn about being a coach. Go and educate mm -hmm. yourself on all these training methods and training principles. Because funnily enough, if you take everything that you learn on a PT course and everything you learn from all these other people, now go and apply that to an extreme sports athlete and watch them tell you to fuck off. <laughs> go and tell a BMX rider yeah. to start progressively overloading on unilateral lower leg development strength, he's probably going to look at you and go, fuck off, son. The skill yeah. that our training needs to complement the sports or the lifestyle that the individual has, not the other way around. Remember, you've got to find a way for you to become a, not a necessity in people's life, not a commodity. Yet trainers think we are necessities. Of course we do. We're biased. But all of that stuff that you've learned from a PT level three course or a strength and conditioning level four course or a degree or a master's or a doctorate where you specialize down the street, you then apply that to another walk of life. It doesn't mean shit about fuck, literally, because it's so nuanced in every single fitness journey. The answer is always context dependent and it depends because I guarantee everything that you've learned in your life about Composition, transformation, diet, training, progressive overload, strength work, periodized training, undulating periodized training, block periodized programming, whatever those things are, you now go and give that to somebody in the extreme sports world. They'll look at you and go, <laughs> you're having a laugh, ain't you, son? Mm -hmm. Like, I am a full-time professional BMX rider. You want me to go into the gym three times a week and squat, lunge, push, pull, brace, rotate, hinge. And then you want me to do all this core work? No, that's not what you're there for. Is there like, do you see where I'm going with that? It's kind of like, ah, okay, that makes sense. And I think mm. that we're so, we're trying to make sure my words are correct here. We're at danger of, niching down into too much of a specific field and thinking that that applies to every human being that you work with when in actuality we need to try and learn as much as we can from all different types of people in this industry and try and give those little snippets to each client that you work with i have professional soldier athletes tactical athletes that you know and you can go and find a specialist that works in that very only works specifically in that field People like Mike Chadwick, the guys from Omnia Performance who work in the tactical sphere. Go and work with X, Y, and Z. Like these guys, these work in tactical athlete performance. I, I'm, I'm, in that, I'm in that realm as well. I'm as qualified as they are. But that doesn't apply to the people that come from me from other walks of life. 
what about the individuals that are a paramedic and they work shift work? Mm -hmm. And we need to improve the other facets of their health, happiness, wealth, and performance. What about their sleep quality? And the sleep hygiene shit gets branded around all the time, but do people actually fucking understand what we mean by sleep hygiene? Do we understand the four phases that we go through? Do we understand how our circadian rhythm works? Do you understand how our 60, 90, two hours before relate to that sleep quality and sleep hygiene? Do you understand how our nutrition relates to that? And nutrient density and nutrient timing relates to how we sleep and how well we sleep. The time we wake up in the morning, the exposure to sunlight, the vitamin D supplementation, how our iron levels affect these things, how like people don't know this. And from a paramedic, like, and this is why you've got to work with lots of different people and work with other coaches, I think, to find that, like, how these apply to people. Because what I do with a tactical athlete that's preparing to go on the all arms commando course down in fucking Limpston, or going up to Catrick to do P Company, like, these are, these are huge, arduous courses. That that frame of reference and how those people work doesn't relate to the individual that is really trying to find balance in their life, in, in their work, in their relationship intimately with their family, their children. That doesn't relate to the tactical athlete method of training. Mm -hmm. It has to relate to the lifestyle piece that that individual needs. Well, what about that person that is actually, they're in good shape, but they're lacking self-efficacy we have to go through some sort of behavioral change framework. We've got to understand and really compartmentalize things for them. How can, what method do we want to work with them? How do we want to go down a route with them? Do we try a little bit of CB, CBT with them? Do we find a way in which we can eliminate this irrational thought process of I'm not good enough to do that. I can't go in that area of the gym. How do I escape that thought? Like that person needs a different mindset. When I'm working with a soldier tactical athlete, it's like, Okay, there are no excuses. We have to do A, y, and X, B, A, B, C, and D, X, Y, and Z, because X member is relying on you to do this. You've got to cover X distance in X amount of time carrying X amount of load. No one's going to care if there's a bullet flying at you. And you've got to move X meters per second to ensure that you don't get fucking shot by that bullet. So the strength that you have directly applies to the rate of force that you're able to reduce, produce and the speed and the cadence in which you're able to attack that undulating ground and get out of that line of fire. That doesn't apply mindset piece to somebody who is not confident and doesn't understand why they, why they can go into that area of the gym. Mm. That doesn't come from sitting down and going doing a six week PT course and then niching down into one area, in my opinion, which is why people say, who do you work with? <laughs> I work with, anyone that wants to optimize their health and performance and bridge the gap between the two. Mm -hmm. You can I think take it all that comes back any to, context. Sorry, I think it all comes back to this discussion of optimal versus sustainable. Yeah. Because ultimately we can, we can sit around, we can discuss the science, we can say, look, this is how to elicit the most amount of hypertrophy in the shortest amount of time. So someone comes to you, they want to build muscle. Fine. These are the points that we have to do. But if you are, you know, let's use Jill as a name, for example, Jill is a housewife. She has, you know, she might be single. She might be married. She's got multiple, multiple children, has a day job. Fine. Yeah. Now the amount of times I see coaches, personal trainers training Jill in a way that is, you know, the old school bodybuilding split, you know, and just, you know, expecting them to stick to a, a, a regimented meal plan and just everything is so regimented. That, and, you know, when I, when I talk to them and they'll say, Dan, you know, the, like think this isn't going well for this reason. And I'm like, well, you're trying to train your client in the same way that you would train yourself. And that's simply, it's just not going to work for many reasons, but there's lots, I'm in India at the moment, as you know, and the, the standard of coaching at the moment in India is very much the majority of it is that, you know, yeah. you will see their clients trained in a manner where they want to train themselves. Mm -hmm. So 
that's what I'm doing. You know, I'm having these conversations with coaches and, and saying, well, you know, have you, have you thought about the fact that, you know, they might not actually be wanting to achieve what you're wanting to achieve? And are you actually listening to what they want to achieve yeah. and their objections? The biggest lesson that I took away from going from being a face-to-face person or trainer to being an online trainer was the fact that I'd worked with so many people. And I'd, I'd worked with different walks of life like you like you do. I'd worked with 80, 85 year old clients who were just literally looking at increasing the quality of their life. Yeah. That was it, you know, and you can't train those. You can't get, give them a, a chicken, broccoli and rice meal plan and go, yeah, you know, if you eat this, you are going to get into the shape because also they might not want that. Like, are you being present again? It comes back to that. Are you actually listening to what they want or are you just going to each individual client with a predetermined set of, okay, we'll do this, we'll do that, blah, blah, blah. And it's one thing that at the start of my career, I got very wrong. I wasn't listening to what people wanted to achieve. I wasn't listening to what their barriers were. I would go into it and I would pitch. I would go in and go, okay, this is what I can do for you. Hmm. Now my consultations, my conversations, just gym experiences with people. I let them talk to me. I let them just verbal diarrhea, whatever they want to, and then just stay curious, stay open and be like, okay, yeah, I hear that. You know, if someone's saying that they're really struggling, one of my clients, they're really struggling with the program. I'm like, okay, you know, I, I hear that it's difficult for you. What, what can we do? You know, where, what areas are you really struggling with? You know, is it the food? Okay, fine. Let's look at what we can do to make things a bit more sustainable what can we do to make things enjoyable what is it that you're finding difficult about it is it a time issue if it's a time issue can we implement something to help you be more efficient there's lots of things that i think that as soon as you are leading from a place of serving as opposed to well you know i've i've given you this program like just stick to it that's fucking easy right like we could just just tick the boxes and you hear that a lot it's something in the industry that you do hear like tick the boxes get in the trenches, do the work. And it doesn't help because people yeah. know that. But ultimately, if they're not a hardcore bodybuilder, if they're not a tactical you know, athlete, you can't treat the general populace in that manner because they'll just tell you to fuck off. Agreed. Absolutely agree. Like, it, and it's a shame. It's not a shame because I think it's, the, the industry ha- is getting better. I think it's getting better. I'm optimistic. I try mm-hmm. to be an optimism, uh, an optimist, should I say, rather than a pessimist. Um, but I think the industry is only getting better. There are incredible coaches out there delivering incredible packages to upscale and upgrade other coaches, their knowledge base. You know, there are so many different people that are doing that now. Mm-hmm. That and it, and it, which is this, it's less, it's less about yes, it's got to be about the business, but it's more about world class results. How can you get world-class results for the individual that's on the other end of that phone or on the other end of that Zoom call or on the other end of that Mm -hmm. consultation or on the other end of your face-to-face coaching journey? Like, how do you package something up that's going to get that person to A, B, C, and D rather than... And let's let's not beat around the bush here. You can have frameworks. I have loads of frameworks, frameworks that fit different people. If If it's optimizing composition and they're a woman that has an arthritic hip and they're over the age of 40, 45, 50. There are things that will match up with other women that are over that age and they have an arthritic hip, of course. Equally, if there is a young 25-year-old man who has a performance-based goal of joining the army, there are frameworks that we can use to develop. But the individualization, uh, the, the, the bespoke nature of that program and the bespoke nature of that design and coaching comes back to actually listening to your client mm-hmm. where are they at in their journey where are their experiences what's their training maturation age what type of what type of lifestyle do they have what type of profession do they currently live by what's their nutritional markers look like what's the quality of their sleep what's their stress management piece look like you know how do how how, how do they compartmentalize all of those areas of their life then we can talk about the intensity the volume the frequency the time demand we can talk about which route we need to go down and how we can individualize a process and a framework to make it fit their goals and their needs and their desires. That's what you do as a coach. 
like you have frameworks. And over the years, you just get better at having frameworks. You get better at going, ha, that framework's going to work for him. Or bang, that framework's going to work for her. That's a great framework. We might need to add a little bit of this and that in there because maybe there's an alternate goal that we're trying to buzz around. And yeah, it, it, it's def I think it's getting better. I think the only thing I wish is that people just would speak more client and think science. I just wish people would speak more client and would just understand how other people are going to consume that information. Like, you are free to call it whatever the fuck you want. Hypertrophy, whatever. Like, you know, tissue resilience or tissue building or whatever the fuck you want to call it. Like, but the bottom line is it's you're building muscle for your client. Mm -hmm. You can talk about aerobic capacity and aerobic energy system development. <laughs> aerobic cardio training. We're just doing some form of aerobic cardiovascular training. We're improving your heart and lungs. We're making the heart and lungs a little bit more efficient. So that when the time comes and you need that, guess what? We can use it. We're not going to be out of breath. We're able to supply. And again, put it in simple language. We're able to supply all of those working pieces in your body with the nutrients it needs. Guess what does that? It's your ticker. We need that help, right? Well, that's keeping things simple. But I think we've got to a stage where everybody is like trying to put content out to impress another fucking coach. Your client needs you. It needs their language. You need to speak client and think science is great. You can think all the science you want, but if your client looks at that and goes, you've just said hypertrophy and a mechanism of which improving hypertrophy is mechanical, is mechanical, uh, fucking I've lost my word here, metabolic stress, mechanical sort of tension, muscle damage, you're explaining all of these three components to them and they're like, huh? What the hell does that yeah. mean? Like you're talking about three pillars of hypertrophy when in ultimate all fact, actuality, if the simple thing for them is we're going to build muscle and what I want you to do is I want you to really push that barrier right up to that crux of intensity and failure. Like it should be really challenging for you. Almost like you're taking a really big poo and it's not quite coming out. Like that's the language of your client. Mm-hmm. But we proceed as coaches because we're told in an industry to, you've got to be firing out A, B, C, and D, but you've got to, you've got to keep it simple, stupid. You've got to really understand what your client needs and wants and how they speak. And if you have a client that's more technologically gifted or more intuitive with their language and they understand fitness and health, you can do that. You can absolutely mm. do that. So I think the industry is getting better, but at, but at the expense of getting better, I also think people are slightly maybe complicating things a little bit. It's great to think complexity. It's great to think science and all the work in a workings of how we periodize and how we program and how we put pieces to a puzzle. That's great. And I think that's, that's needed more rather than just thinking simple. But what comes out needs to be, needs to be understandable on that level. I just think every client I speak to, if it was my daughter, that's the type of narrative I would use. And not to be detriment, no, not in a detrimental or derogatory way, as in, you know, I want you to take A, go and do the B, and then the outcome will be C. Happy with that? Does that make sense? Yeah, cool. Mm -hmm. Let's go do that. Let's see if that works first. And if that doesn't work, then we'll try D, to potentially work through E and then get F. And it's mm -hmm. that, right? You know, and you, you, I think if we, yeah. if we all just like were present and listened, actively listened to our client, actually listened to our client, and we just sat back and thought, right, okay, what, what's a really simple way that's going to speak their language? As a mum of three, how can I make it sound and resonate with her? Ah, okay, that'll work. So I think there is, yeah, the, we, we, and maybe that's why people resonate with me because I keep it simple mm. and I make it really easy to digest in what, it, and again, you get, you get 90 seconds and what, 500, however many characters, 2000 characters on an Instagram post. 
you ain't going to be able to get much out on that. <laughs> I'm afraid if you're hoping for a for a world yeah. world class change, you ain't going to get it off of Instagram. You know, it takes a it takes a lot more than that. So, yeah, it's definitely an interesting concept, though. I think it all comes back as well to what are you what are you doing in terms of who are you trying to surf? Because it's it's purely from an ego position that coaches get into the 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 massive terminology multiple syllable words because they want to impress whether it's the client whether it's other coaches and that's what it falls down to but if we just sit back we stay present and we think okay the, the most important thing here is my client results yeah i need them to buy into this process i need them to understand what we're doing and if if you're just chucking terminology at them to show that you know your shit they're not going to understand. They're not going to buy into it because they're going to go, hold on a second. I wanted to go to the gym. I wanted to just lift some weights. And now I'm being told about mechanical tension, mechanical drop sets. And yes. we're talking about levers and angles. <laughs> what the fuck? Like now I'm doing physics. I just wanted to go and build a little bit of muscle, drop a bit yeah. of fat, get into the dress that I've not been able to get into for a few years. Yeah. And I think you're right. You know, it is a case of just for want of a better terminology is just dumbing it down, saying it in layman's terms. Like we've got to a position, as you said, where it's ego. Mm. Like who are you trying to impress? Are we still trying to betray more knowledge than we potentially do have? Are we using words? Are we posting, you know, materialistic things on social media to impress people that we don't actually care about? Don't actually it don't make any difference, you know, and then this falls into the same category, in my opinion, if we're staying present and we're making sure that we're ultimately serving our clients and serving the, the greater population, you know, are we serving, are we here as on our purpose? For me, you sound like you're exactly the same. The reason why I'm in coaching is because I love helping people. I love helping their mindsets. 100%. And, and there's no other thing that's come close to that in my life that's been as rewarding and it's been as, as just such an incredible process where you can take someone who comes to you who is in a position where they're not confident enough to take their top off in their own house in front of their spouse to, you know, messaging you a few months down the line saying, oh, my God, like I'm now wearing the bikini I never thought I'd wear. I'm confident. My sex life has improved. You know, I'm, I'm just the person that I've always wanted to be, you know, that story might not resonate, but it could be anything. And just taking someone from little self-esteem, little self-belief to much more, it's just, you can't beat it. You can't, there is, there is no greater feeling. And I'm in a really privileged position in life at the moment where I am online coaching 40, 50 hours a week. If anybody tells you you can online coach three hours a day and be become a success, they're lying to you. Um, but I'm in an amazing position. My full-time profession is working with 500 individuals on a daily basis for X amount of hours every day. And just seeing something like, ah, dude, let me try and do something with that pattern. Let, let's try and put, let's say a really simple thing. Let's place a heel block underneath you when you do that squat let's see if you can get a bit of deeper range ah cool how did that feel oh it felt amazing do you feel stronger in that position yeah like and they come out with this moment of elation like they're, they're smiling they're like wow that was awesome that i felt really good on that one because the one before was so difficult like i have those pockets of moments every single day and the people the very few people that work in the field that i work in we're very privileged to be able to do that You'll be hard pressed to find anybody that has that amount of man hours of practical one-to-one -one coaching every single day. Like you'd be very hard pressed to see that. Like four or 500 people every day, three, four hours a day on average, four days, five days a week. That's a lot of hours when you can pile it on for each individual. And to see like little pockets of moments and like smile on someone's faces when they've hit a high threshold session and they've come away like that was tough, but what a session, what a session. That was unbelievable. I loved it. Like that's why, that's why we do what we're doing. 
That's why we're all doing what we're doing. Because infinitely we have a purpose. And I know what my greatest goal is. I know what I want to achieve. I know what I want to achieve in family and social life. I know what I want to achieve in business. I know what I want to achieve in profession. And as a coach, I feel like it shouldn't be the first thing, the first thing that you want to achieve as a coach, it shouldn't be about making millions. It shouldn't be about making boatloads of money. Yes, you have to make money because you are a coach. But if you're in that business, if you're in this, if you're in the fitness industry for that reason, I think it's going to be quite premature. And yeah. you're probably going to be vacated out of the industry quickly because you haven't really done the purpose and reason. Like you've been in the industry a long time. Like I remember doing this on stupid word documents and writing shit out in a notebook and giving that notebook to a client each week to fill out and then giving it back to me and having to do it all in a day in an A4 binded notebook. <laughs> And writing out their training program for the next week. Oh, well, we're going to do this. And I want you to see this. Like, I want you to write down how you feel. How was the session? What was your sort of difficulty level? How was food? How was sleep? Boom, boom, boom. Like writing that shit down in a notebook. <laughs> and if, you, if you've been through those processes, the older sweats and bloody hell, we're old. But those older sweats amongst us, to me, that, that actually bound the purpose of why we do coaching. Because when you see a little number like, oh, I've increased this by this many reps or I fit into this dress. Uh, one of my clients sent me a photo. Um, I said to her the, the other week, I went, you know, we were talking about, you know, dates coming up. What have we got planned? So oh, I've got a hem weekend in a couple of weekends time and I, I actually can't wait. I went, ah, what an opportunity. I want you to send me a picture of you in your outfit. And she sent me a photo and I put it next to one of her initial photos when we first joined. And I said to her, what do you see? And the most amazing thing of, I see sexy. I see confidence. I see Wonder Woman. I see power. I see mm -hmm. tenaciousness. I feel amazing. And I look happy. And for somebody to pull that out of a photo, that's impact. That's mm -hmm. coaching. And that's a remarkable place to be if you have that level of impact on somebody's life. Like there's no greater, there's genuine, like find me a job where I get to do this and get paid to do this. Like what the hell, that's unbelievable. I wake up every day and be surrounded by people that just want to be better. Like that's fucking remarkable. I just want nothing more than to be the best. And I get to do fitness every day. Like, this isn't a job. This is like, this is brilliant. It's absolutely fantastic. And I get, to, I get to do this in two spheres, in my professional world and in my business. Like, what a bloody place to be. And I think if you have that as a coach, it's like, yeah. And you have that. You get to do it every day with the people you work with out in India. But you also get to do it online with amazing human beings. And I would not, we would have never connected had it not been for the fitness industry. Yeah. We would have never have had over a bloody hell. We've been online. We've been talking for nearly two hours. We would, because of before, but we would have never had that depth and level of conversation if one of us wasn't passionate. Because it'd be tumbleweed moments. It'd be like, oh, this is shit. But guess what? Because we're present. We're actively listening. We truly love what we do. We love the industry. And like, have, has this, like, has this two hour conversation been longer than expected? Yeah. But guess what? We're present in the moment and it's real. And that's the same thing with every client. You know, I have a 45 minute check-in with my clients and dude's like 45 minutes for a check-in. I'm like, yeah, you're fucking damn right. 45 minutes for a check-in. What if that client needs my help? What if that, like, I'm here to help them? They are my people. I can't do five, 10 minute check-ins. That might work for some, not for me. Like, people need my time. People came to me for a service. People came to me for impact. People came for health freedom. Let me give them that. Let me stop. And I've just got, we've got to stop looking for, oh, where's the next, where's that next 
20 clients coming from so I can make six figures because I've got to reach 8,400 pounds per per month to be able to achieve that six. No, bollocks. Mm -hmm. What can you do for the people that you work with right now? The people in your life that really mean a great deal to you. And as fucking philosophical and namby pamby hairy fairy and fruity tooty as you might think that may be as a listener, I don't care <laughs> because I'm the happiest person I could be right now. I'm happy and I'm in a great space and there's a lot of evolution and growth to go still, but, but you are the same. You wouldn't have gone to India if you didn't love your job. Mm -hmm. And this is an amazing experience because we get to do this on a podcast. Like that for me is that's present. Mm -hmm. That's why we do what we do. So what a beautiful message to finish on. I think, I think um, it's been an absolute pleasure and the conversation has just absolutely flown by. Yeah. Thank you for coming on. We need to do a part two because we oh, barely scratched the surface here. Um, we, so definitely we need to do. do a part two. We need to invite you on to a formal. Here's my formal invitation to you to come on the art of performance podcast. Cause I think we would erupt another conversation. I'd love to have you on. And Let's this part, it. yeah, like, thank you. Thank you for, thank you for the wonderful introduction at the start. I really, really appreciate it. And just, yeah, really, really thank you for having an opportunity to share a story with you and talk about something that we clearly both love. Um, mm. Because I don't think we do it enough. I really don't. I said to somebody, one of my, uh, one of the guys that's in the supercharge group, it's like, imagine if we were surrounded by five people from the supercharge group every single day for a year. Imagine yeah. where you would be as a coach, not business, as a coach. Mm -hmm. Like, imagine how self-aware, how, how amazing that would be. Like, we can dream it. Maybe it could be a reality one day, but it, being yeah. in a boardroom with, or just in a big office space with 20 other coaches that are all online coaching and doing their things. And we've got like, this yeah. crazy creative space. Like imagine that it'd be unbelievable. Yeah. yeah. It's been a great conversation. And I really appreciate you for inviting me on and long may more con conversations continue. We'll definitely have a part two dude. And, um, before we go, where mm. can people find more about you? Ah, uh, bloody hell on the spot. Now I've got to try and remember handle. So my, my Instagram, I'm probably the most frequent on. Uh, and that's coach, I think there's an, uh, coach underscore Dean underscore Hammond, um, something like that. Um, I'm on, I've started to put a little bit more on YouTube, coach Dean Hammond as well. Uh, Facebook, I'm all the same. I think they're all relatively same, some with underscore, some without, um, but I'm, I'm across there, every social media platform. And I've just, I've given in the past three months and gone onto TikTok to try and wean through myths, but it's uh, yeah. it's proving to be more difficult than the other one so yeah uh -huh. but like with anything perseverance right i'll uh, link everything down below so we'll make sure we get all of those for people to find you absolute pleasure once again thank you so much amazing conversation brother i'll speak to you soon